So before we enter the wild world of postmodern architecture, let's run through a quick review. This is Lewis Sullivan's Carson Perry Scott Department Store, a required work and one which you can see has featured in AP Questions in the past. The building employed the new technologies that made skyscrapers possible, not just steel frames, but also reinforced concrete and elevators. The strength of steel I-beams and reinforced concrete also permitted the large windows and open and flexible interior spaces, again, important for the building's function as a store. Louis Sullivan's most famous apprentice was Frank Lloyd Wright, also a Chicago architect and the most important proponent of what is known as the Prairie School. Now, past College Board questions on his work focus on Wright's efforts to establish an organic relationship between structure and site, something that's going to be important in this unit's architecture as well. Another Wright innovation previously beloved by the College Board is the use of cantilevers. Those balconies extending out over the water are cantilevered or attached to the building at just one end. International style architects also imply cantilevering to attach office tower floors to internal steel and concrete shafts. Since the walls weren't as necessary for support, they could be filled with windows. What medieval innovations produced a similar effect in Gothic cathedrals? Flying buttresses, rib vaults, and pointed arches all shifted weight away from exterior walls, which in turn allowed church designers to incorporate the stained glass window walls that light up Gothic cathedrals. So this is a famous international style house built by a famous international style architect, Le Corbusier. The work embodied the international style slogans. Which ones do you remember? Well, the biggies are less is more, form follows function, buildings should be machines for living. So this house also used up-to-date technology materials, including poured reinforced concrete. Like falling water, it was integrated into its surroundings and had an open floor plan. So the Seagram building is in many ways a more typical and famous example of the international style, which came to be associated with ornamental glass and steel rectangles that speared up into the sky. The Seagram building is actually a little more decorative than many because of the bronze accents in the plaza set back from the street. Still, the basic rectangular glass, concrete, and steel tower became the iconic work of architecture well into the 1970s. So here's another past AP question, very similar to the one I just showed you. The required work skip over another aspect of post-war architecture that's going to be important in this unit as well. And that's architecture that took on an organic, even sculptural form, even as it employed new materials such as steel reinforced concrete. Indeed, because concrete was hardened in molds, it actually lent itself to more sculptural designs. Stay tuned for Zaha Hadid. This was Frank Lloyd Wright's last work, but it's not the Guggenheim that appears on our list of required works. Some of you are confused by this. This is the Guggenheim that we just visited in New York City. Like the Le Corbusier Chapel, this building was designed to be a kind of sculpture, or at least to reflect sculptural forms. We'll get to the other Guggenheim in just a minute, but first, let's look at the reaction against the international style. Ah, more generational rebellion on the way. So this isn't a required work anymore, but you should recognize the architect because it's the same fellow who helped design the Seagram building. This building was in some ways Johnson's apology, his mea culpa, for all those glass and steel towers he'd foisted on the world but we can still see a lot of international style elements. The simple and unornamented exterior with the streamlined effect. The function is largely evident from its exterior. This is a form follows function building still. The building retains a basic rectilinear shape and in general, the design remains highly geometric. So what's different about this? What makes it postmodern? You read about this last night. And by the way, I could imagine you getting a similar attribution style question about this building because it kills two birds, two art history birds with one stone. So some possible answers. The building is not a glass box. It's clad in granite. 
a return to the tradition of using stone for ornamentation and structural support, although less that. The building also harks back to history in its decorative effects. So we see that broken pediment at the top. It was characteristic of Baroque and neoclassical architecture. I've got a little example in the bottom corner. At the top, also rather whimsically, resembled 18th century Chippendale furniture, if anybody has a high boy in their house. So you saw this quote in your reading, I hope. So again, the 1980s and beyond witnessed a widespread rebellion against the uniformity and anonymity of international style office towers. One criticism leveled against them is that these designs were simply too generic. They said nothing about the history or culture of the particular community where they were built. In other words, they were too international. And finally, we get to a required work. So again, what makes this house postmodern? Well, it's geometric still, but the geometry is much more whimsical and varied curves have entered in. Remember, this is the guy who wrote a manifesto entitled Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture and a book entitled Learning from Las Vegas. Venturi himself describes this as preferring, quote, messy vitality over obvious unity, unquote. So in his design for this house, Venturi clearly referenced some earlier historical styles, and he displayed his knack for razzle-dazzle and designs to catch the eye, something he presumably learned from Las Vegas. Venturi pretty clearly rejects the form follows function formula. That arch, for example, is almost entirely decorative, although it actually did serve one function. The family was avid bird watchers, and this made their movements a little less obvious to the birds. And finally, the house reflected the history and traditions of its particular setting. Uh, the architect himself emphasized that it was a shout out of sorts to the barns that were characteristic of this part of the world. So here we see that while Venturi borrows from historical styles, the arch and the column, his work is much less imitative than, for example, a neoclassical architect's work would be. No Greek temple designer would have gotten away with these flat columns or so freely abandoned symmetry for a deliberate asymmetry. Postmodern architects mine history for ideas, but they almost never slavishly imitate. They like to play with what they find. So we see a similar, I keep using the same term, whimsy, a sense of fun in the house's interior. Postmodern architects are also much less afraid of color. So here's another Venturi house. It's showed up on the AP exams before. This is one he actually designed for his mother. So again, we see that decorative arch and the broken pediment, uh, although in this case a rectangular one, one last Venturi building. Note the variety of geometric forms and the purely decorative elements. Means van der Rohe would have hated this. So here's a famous postmodern building that's not on the list, and the architect worked with Philip Johnson on the AT&T Sony building I just showed you. So again, how does this break with international style? So it's another past AP question. Well, after years of emphasizing the vertical, the design is reasserting the horizontal. We also see that stylized and reinterpreted classical elements there are pilasters, that is engaged, square engaged columns. There are garlands, there are keystones, and the multiple colors are another postmodern feature. And so here you see a past AP question uh, that compares these postmodern buildings and asks what makes them postmodern. Again, I'm getting repetitive here, playful and extravagant forms, often using decoration that's not functional. The design is neither severe nor entirely serious, and both buildings include an eclectic mix of historical references. The architects actively resist a sense of unity. And now we really get weird. Now your homework mentioned that the Guggenheim Bilbao was the centerpiece of an urban revitalization project for an aging port city, Bilbao, Spain. It did not talk about how the setting and history influenced the design. So looking at this building, what does it remind you of? Maybe a ship with billowing sails?
uh, maybe a ship that got blown up by a bomb. And in fact, Bilbao is the capital of the Basque region of Spain, which is a region with an active separatist movement where bombs do periodically explode. It's also an industrial city that has lost much of its industry and needed a repurposed downtown. So Gary's museum has proved an extraordinarily successful draw, so popular that efforts to use culture to revitalize cities is now sometimes called the Bilbao effect. So this aerial view gives you a little better idea of how the museum was anchored to the riverfront, which is now a park complex. And the video will give you a better idea still of this very complicated building and site. So Gary is the most famous deconstructivist architect, although interestingly, he personally rejects that term, but everybody else seems to think he's a deconstructivist. So let's talk about what that term means. Here is the building that thrust Frank Gary into the, into the limelight. It's his own house. It started off as a generic Dutch roofed suburban house and under his direction, it morphed into this collection of industrial materials. We see chain link fence, we see plywood, galvanized zinc, cinder block, exposed wood framing, all arranged into lopsided cubes. Again, it looks like something exploded in there. You do have to wonder what the neighbors thought. Anyway, here's how Wikipedia defines deconstructivism. It's actually as clear as anything else I came across. Deconstructivism is, quote, characterized by fragmentation an interest in manipulating a structure's surface, skin, in non-rectilinear shapes, which appear to distort and dislocate traditional elements of architectural structure. In other words, looking at deconstructivist architecture, walking into a deconstructivist building is a little bit like walking into an Alice in Wonderland experience, a fun house, if you will. The finished visual, that's from me, not Wikipedia. The finished visual appearance is characterized by, and we're back at Wikipedia now, unpredictability and controlled chaos. Actually, it's very controlled chaos. One of my favorite quotes is, to err is human, to really foul up requires a computer. Well, it turns out that to really deconstruct, at least to deconstruct buildings that are not going to fall down, even if it looks like they're going to, also requires a computer. These twisting curves are extremely complex mathematically, and they were designed using a 3D design software developed by the aerospace industry called CADIA, which allows architects to create complex designs and make calculations that just wouldn't have been possible a few years ago. Basically, the software digitizes points on the edges, surfaces, and intersection of Gary's hand-built models and then constructs on-screen models that can be manipulated. You know, think of manipulating animated cartoons. This is computer-aided graphics, right? Just like you see in the movies. The building's walls and ceilings are load-bearing and they contain an internal structure made up of metal rods that form grids made up of triangles. So CADIA, the software, basically calculates the number of bars that each location requires and the positions and orientation, again, needed so that the building doesn't fall down, even if it looks like it's going to. The walls and ceilings also, and this is a very important element of this building, have several insulating layers and a thin outer coating of titanium, which has been textured in a way that helps give it a, a mottled surface that catches the light. So why titanium? Uh, this is where I really started geeking out, and I found a National Geographic engineering video that answers the question. So here's our last required image from this work. It demonstrates how carefully the building was designed to suit its riverside site and the industrial surroundings that it both echoed and transcended. I'm going to show you three other Frank Gehry deconstructed buildings, all very distinctive. I'm struck that most of these deconstructivist buildings are either cultural centers or university buildings. In other words, these are works designed for patrons who might be more tolerant of highly experimental designs and maybe patrons whose functional demands are more flexible. It's a little hard to see any of these functioning as an office building. 
Our final architectural work is also a museum designed by Iraqi-born British architect Zaha Hadid. And she just died on March 31st, 2016, and her obituaries repeatedly note that she's one of the most acclaimed female architects, really one of the most acclaimed architects, period, working in the 21st century. So this building is a museum of contemporary art in Rome. Uh, it's actually two museums combined. The companion features 21st century architecture. So as we just race through 20th and 21st century architecture again, let's ask, where would you place this work? What category? Well, it's not an international style glass, steel, and metal box not anywhere nearly rectilinear enough, but neither is it quite as deconstructed as Gary's Bilbao Museum. The columns and the overhang actually remind me a little of Villa Savoy. The material here again is molded concrete. On the other hand, this architect is clearly playing with geometry in an innovative and maybe slightly disruptive way. She, like Gary, seeks to integrate her design into the urban setting. Uh, the magazine Architecture Today commented about this building that, quote, a pedestrian walkway follows the outline of the building, restoring an urban link that has been blocked for almost a century by the military barracks that previously occupied the site. And again, this is an element of all postmodernist architecture, and the deconstructivists uh, really fit into that broader category, which is to make buildings more relevant to the particular place where they're built. Hadid was also influenced by Russian revolutionary art and architecture. Uh, the geometric suprematist paintings of Kasimir Malevich and constructivist architecture. On the right, there's a famous example of constructivist art architecture, the Zuri of Workers' Hall, uh, back from a period, 1926, when Soviet leaders were still encouraging artistic experimentation. You see this mixture of rectilinear and curvilinear forms, a kind of experimentation, but starker, not as playful, I think, as Venturi or Gary. And I think we can see that influence in the building. It's a little hard to see this from the required images, but the virtual plan makes her underlying design clearer. Basically, the building is composed of bending oblong tubes. I'm talking about its interior. It's almost like a clover leaf on an interstate highway. The curved side walls are made of concrete and the internal stairways of black painted steel. So let's watch a video made by Zaha Hadid's uh, architectural firm, which includes the architect's own explanation of what she was hoping to accomplish. Then I want you to stop and talk, at least briefly, about whether she succeeded, whether this form will indeed suit the function of a multi-purpose, multicultural art center. Something I really wonder about all of these postmodern works is, how will they age? What are they going to look like in 50 years? Are they really going to fit their function? Form uh, follows function may not be as popular anymore, but buildings do still need to function. So here are a couple more Zaha Hadid buildings. Note that both highly geometric and irregular, less whimsical than postmodern architecture of Venturi, for example, but not quite as deconstructed as Frank Gehry's works. If we have time, I'm hoping we'll be able to move on to the equally wild world of video art.